morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's AAPS eChalk Talk. Today's eChalk Talk is hosted by Sertara. You may submit your questions at any time during the talk by entering them into the questions box of the GoToWebinar platform. It is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Sertara's Director of Content Strategy, Dr. Suzanne Minton. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stacy, for that introduction, and thank you to AAPS for letting us produce this webinar with them. Hello. Uh, today's presentation is the FDA Modernization Act 2.0. What does it mean for pharmaceutical scientists? Our speaker today is Dr. Jim Herman. Jim is currently a vice president of toxicology at Sertara where he leads a group of nine toxicologists providing strategic, operational, and tactical consulting services to small and large pharmaceutical companies worldwide. He has more than 34 years of experience managing the non-clinical development of novel pharmaceuticals from discovery through successful registration. Jim holds a PhD in toxicology and was a diplomat of the American Board of Toxicology from 1992 to 2022. Jim, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to him to begin the presentation. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and before I start, let me say that the um, information expressed in these slides are, are really re a reflection of my opinion and not necessarily, um, you know, the, the opinions of Sertara, of Sertara as a company or APS. So um, with that, we'll move on. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, Previously, FDA was mandated to have sponsors include animal testing and drug discovery and development programs. That mandate ended with the December 2002 passage of the FDA Modernization Act. And what I'm going to focus on today is um, how non-clinical scientists may be able to use innovative cutting-edge technologies in future drug development, discovery and development programs. And hopefully at the end of this session, you'll come away with an appreciation of how this change can facilitate expanded use of alternatives to animal testing, including things like biosimulation, organ on a chip, cell-based assays, uh, et cetera. We'll also touch a little bit on best practices in toxicology to, to streamline non-clinical development and assessment of drug safety, things that can be implemented uh, today as well as some coming trends in the industry to support the three R's of animal testing, i.e. reduce, refine, and replace the use of animals uh, in pharmaceutical development. Uh, Suzanne's already given you a bit of, uh, bit of my uh, history. I uh, have a BS in chemistry, a PhD in toxicology. I was a board certified toxicologist for 30 years have uh, 20 years experience in large pharma and the last 16 years uh, or so uh, as a consultant, as part of a consulting group, uh, now part of Sertara. Uh, my specific areas of expertise include strategic toxicology program design and execution for small molecules and biologics. I have extensive experience with regulatory document preparation and regulatory authorities interactions. And there's my contact information uh, should you need it. So the FDA Modernization Act. What the act does is actually eliminate the 80-year-old mandate that required animal testing before human clinical trials. Uh, before that was something that FDA had to do by law. And it provides drug developers, I think, with the opportunity to use alternative non-animal human relevant methods to assess non-clinical efficacy and safety. And I would say that um, before anyone chooses to implement any of these alternatives, it's always a good idea to have a discussion uh, with FDA to make sure that they're in agreement with your proposed um, strategies. Unlike what was uh, indicated in some of the popular press when the act was first passed, the act does not eliminate animal testing. It simply eliminates the mandate for testing. And um, 
in particular for the assessment of non-clinical safety in animals. It's, it opens the door, I think, for an expanded use for these alternative, um, alternative uh, approaches. And as many of you know, animal studies play a key role in drug discovery and development. And the purpose of these studies is to identify the best drug candidates and to support the three phases of clinical development. Animal studies not only benefit the development of human medicines, but are also important for the development of veterinary medicines. Positive results in pharmacology studies in animal models of disease can indicate that the drug candidate has the potential to be efficacious in the human disease. Non-clinical pharmacokinetics and drug metabolism studies can predict how a drug candidate will be absorbed, distributed throughout the body, metabolized, and excreted in humans. Non-clinical safety studies or toxicology studies can identify hazards that may be relevant to humans. Together, the results of these non-clinical studies can define doses and exposures that may be safely studied in clinical trials. In addition, animal studies provide the basis to assess potential hazards that we really can't assess in clinical trials. For example, reproductive and developmental effects and the potential for um, carcinogenicity. In my opinion, Animal testing will be a critical part of pharmaceutical development for the foreseeable future. And if that's the case, what impact can the, can the act have? And I think what the, what the act does is actually provide opportunities to drug developers. Again, as I mentioned, to replace, reduce, and refine animal usage, uh, reduce development costs, and potentially reduce development timelines. You know, as, as early as the late 1950s, the principle of the three R's has provided a framework for better stewardship of animal use and research. Uh, as mentioned, the goals of the three R's are to find alternatives to animal testing or replacement, as has been done largely in the cosmetic industry, and to optimize information obtained from fewer animals reduce the number of animals used, and to adopt methods that alleviate distress or refinement of um, how animals are used uh, in, in the studies. These guiding principles aim to improve the quality of science and animal welfare when the use of animals is unavoidable. One of the major contributions that resulted in a substantial reduction in animal use was the adoption of globally harmonized guidelines and regulatory requirements um, for, for studies that support the development of human medicines. As I'm sure uh, many of you are aware, the International Conference Council on Harmonization uh, of the Technical Requirements for Pharmaceuticals for Human Use, or ICH, brought together uh, regulatory authorities and pharmaceutical industry um, leaders to discuss and design, uh, align uh, scientific and technical aspects of drug development. Prior to its inception in 1990, regulatory authority requirements for the same types of studies differed by region around the world. And pharmaceutical developers often had to repeat certain types of studies with slightly different designs to support marketing in various countries. However, with the advent of ICH, study designs have largely been standardized and reducing unnecessary duplication. Some studies, such as acute LD50 studies, which utilized animals, were eliminated. Uh, it's important to note that these efforts are still ongoing. Um, and in fact, in August of last year, ICH updated a guidance document to allow sponsors to possibly eliminate the need to conduct lifetime rodent carcinogenicity studies. Ethically and economically, it makes sense that the pharmaceutical industry continues to look for opportunities to implement the three R's. And I believe that the Modernization Act opens the door for further implementation of the three R's. Jim, just got a question for you. The focus of this webinar has been the FDA, but as we know, pharmaceutical development extends globally. Is there similar support for the three R's in other regions? 
absolutely. And I would say um, about 18 months ago, the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, announced a similar approach as described in the Modernization Act and has been actively and encouraged actively encouraging and investing in these alternate approaches uh, for many years prior to that. So there's definitely a, a global move um, to become more efficient uh, drug developers and uh, use fewer animals in the process. So what are some of these alternative approaches um, that could be considered? And first, I want to say that I am not an expert uh, in any of the potential alternatives to animal testing depicted on this slide. Um, there, are, there are others uh, who can speak much more eloquently about their use and application. Um, but I do see the potential for some of these alternatives, either alone or more likely in combination, to reduce animal usage in the future. As many of you know, in silico modeling techniques uh, are being used to estimate human systemic exposures and efficacious doses of, and exposures based on minimal animal data collected prior to the conduct of clinical trials. And I'll, I'll present one specific example in the next slide. Such in, in silico techniques can be used to inform um, drug use in special populations and also inform drug labeling. In vitro techniques, such as cell cultures, either um, you know, individual cell cultures or two or three D cultures, high throughput screening, um, have been used uh, in pharmacodynamic studies to assess efficacy and potency and are being more accurately uh, are being more refined to more accurately reflect in vivo responses. Um, the in vitro techniques, cell culture techniques, organ culture techniques have also been used uh, to assess um, mechanisms of toxicity uh, uh, once um, an effect has been, been defined. A relatively new advance uh, is, is the so-called organ on a chip. Um, and Organ on chips are systems that are contain engineered or natural miniature tissues grown inside microfluidic chips. And to better mimic human physiology, these chips are designed to control cell microenvironments and maintain tissue specific functions. Um, with organ on a chip, it is possible to assess effects in single tissues or link them together, link these chips together and assess. Um, multiple tissues and the effects that a change in one tissue may have on other tissues. And I think most importantly uh, and excitedly for me is that human tissues can be used in these in these chips and um, once refined and validated could eliminate the need for extrapolation of findings from animal tissues to human tissues. Many of these um, organ on chips are avail available commercially, and I think their use will expand greatly uh, once uh, developers get more experience with them and regulators uh, develop more comfort with the results. And again, as I mentioned, I think that there's probably not going to be any single alternative approach that will replace, replace animal testing. But I think a combination of some of these approaches has the potential to significantly reduce uh, the number of animals used and could potentially replace some studies in the future, resulting in uh, lower costs and faster development timelines. So one of the one of the best established uh, and accepted um, alternative methods to animal testing is the, is the so-called physiologically based pharmacokinetic simulations. And um, again, this is not my area of expertise, but basically you can take data from in vitro inputs, uh, limited data from, from um, some animal tests, and you can develop specific models 
to be able to predict based on the various, what's known about the various um, organ functions and how a drug may be um, uh, distributed throughout the body and, and what happens to it in various organs. And by doing so, you can predict the um, toxicokinetic or par pharmacokinetic profiles and parameters um, in animal studies. And as you get more data, you can refine those models and ultimately um, simulate what human exposures will be to help determine um, what exposures one is likely to achieve in humans uh, based on the dose administered and elimination characteristics. Um, and that can actually help streamline the design of clinical programs because it allows you to, to select doses um, to, to result in the exposures that are believed to be needed, um, you know, to be efficacious and would be safe in humans. And an extension of this PK, PBPK modeling is something called quantitative systems pharmacology or QPS. And it's another very widely used in silico technique. And QSP combines computational modeling and experimental data to examine the relationships between a drug, the biological system, and the disease process. Um, so there's an awful lot of inputs to, this, to these models. And with the ability to leverage vast amounts of biological and pharmacological data, QPS enables the understanding of disease pathophysiology and allows us to identify and test therapeutic strategies in virtual trials with virtual patients. Um, so there's, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool and I know has been used to support um, a lot of drugs that are in development and have been approved. Jim, you've said that there's great potential to further reduce or in some cases eliminate animal use in the future as alternatives are developed, refined, and validated. Are there additional steps that can be implemented now? Um, yes, I believe there are. And some of the things that we've been uh, considering and, and advising clients on to streamline the assessment of non-clinical safety um, are depicted on this slide. Uh, the first one is to really understand uh, prior to the conduct of any safety work, whether it be in animals or in vitro, um, understand the target uh, that, that you're going after. So do a target safety review. And that's by taking into account systems biology, uh, what's known in the literature, uh, what's known about species differences, uh, distribution of the target, uh, affected biochemical pathways from which you might be able to infer uh, potential toxic effects, and then any, any known or potential target organs of toxicity that may be associated with the target. So with that knowledge, um, it allows you to design much more focused early safety studies um, to get a handle on uh, what hazards may be associated with, with your particular compound. Another thing that I think uh, is very important, and, um, and that is the development of sensitive bioanalytical techniques. Currently, uh, many of the bioanalytical techniques that are available to assess systemic exposures in animals require um, a fairly large blood volume. Uh, and in rodent species, typically requires the addition of satellite groups strictly for assessment of exposure. Um, and I think as the bioanalytical techniques get better, um, we can eliminate both satellite groups. And in some instances, you know, cut the animal use in a particular study by 50 or 60%. Uh, another thing uh, that I think is important and we found very helpful is that during the conduct of any animal efficacy studies, uh, where we're looking at the drug, um, uh, looking at proof of pharmacology of the drug, proof of mechanism, uh, and in some animal disease models, efficacy, is to include some limited safety parameters and exposure assessments. So if those studies are going to be conducted anyway with a focus on 
proof of mechanism and efficacy, if we, you know, if a sponsor simply collects some additional parameters, some blood, say, for clinical pathology parameters, or, you know, looks at things like organ weights or assess um, systemic exposures, that information can, again, be very, very important in helping us determine uh, and streamline the design of the, the non-clinical safety studies. And, and finally, something um, that you know, we've been exploring with some of our clients recently is that in the early tolerability and dose range finding studies, we've really um, looked to minimize the number of control animals um, in those studies. Um, you know, rodent toxicology studies and, and studies in large animals have been conducted for a long time. And so there's a lot of historical information that we can compare the results to um, um, as opposed to including um, concurrent uh, control animals. And in particular, um, for some of the non-rodent species like dog or monkey, um, it's possible to use healthy non-naive animals uh, and compare those results with any pretest values and again with the historical control data. So I think there's some, some things we can implement now fairly easily that will, uh, in the long run, uh, in a particular program, reduce the number of animals that are that will be required to be used. So this little cartoon uh, put together just to kind of depict where we are. So we have the different stages of drug development from discovery through the three phases of clinical development to registration and post-approval. And the size of these uh, little cartoon characters here really reflect the current uh, uh, number of animals used in each of the three phases. Um, and then um, the little needles below kind of represent where we are now and where, we, where I think we can get to through the use of some of these alternative techniques. So there's, there's you know, a fair bit of animal use in the early discovery phase. Um, it's it's sort of leaned, uh, you know, it's not quite 50-50. There's a little bit more animal use than perhaps some of the alternatives, but I think we can switch that around um, such that alternatives are used the majority of time rather than animals. Uh, in early clinical development, phase one and phase two, uh, phase one in particular is, is very animal intensive. Uh, and, and But again, I think we can move that needle back and reduce the number of animals. Phase three, when we get into some of the longer term studies, some of the studies that we can't uh, necessarily assess hazards in humans, things like reproductive effects and carcinogenicity uh, is right now very dependent on use of animal models. But again, I think we can move the needle a little bit there. And with these longer term studies like carcinogenicity studies, which can involve the use of hundreds of animals, you know, if we can eliminate, uh, you know, even 20% of the animals on, in those studies, that's still going to result in a, in a significant savings of time. And then once a drug is on the market, um, generally there's not many non-clinical studies that have to be done, although sometimes there are post-approval commitments. And right now I would say that you know, it's about a 50-50 split between alternative approaches and animal approaches. Um, impurity qualification would be another example. Um, but, but I think, again, I think we have the, the opportunity to, to move the needle um, pretty substantially um, uh, in most of the phases of drug development. So what do we do now? Um, how do we capitalize on the act? How do we take advantage of the opportunities that we have? And the first thing, uh, you know, I would say it's going to take data, data, and more data. Um, because what we in the pharmaceutical industry have to do is we have to agree and demonstrate that these preferred alternative methods um, are in fact human relevant and predictive of what we're likely to expect in, in human, through human use of the drugs. So 
in the short term, there may be some higher costs because you know we're going to basically have to conduct use some of these alternative approaches in conjunction with the standard approaches um, to sh to validate them essentially. But I think in the long term, um, there uh, are pretty pretty substantial time and cost savings that that we could realize from the generation of these data and the development of these alternative methods. And so I think we have to um, agree with regulators, in fact, on what these preferred alternative methods are. And you know, we need to prioritize the evaluation of, of either known compounds and to some degree novel compounds so that we can build confidence in these methods and their, their translatability in concordance with standard, standard animal assessments. In other words, we have to do a lot of work to validate these, these methods. One of the things that I think could really help speed this along would be to establish industry and government consortia to, um, to evaluate some of these alternative methods. Uh, it has the advantage of, sh of shared costs in evaluating them. Uh, it also has the advantage of involving uh, <clears throat> regulatory authorities who have much more data than any individual company or even consortia could have um, to, to be able to help evaluate these models. And I, I think an example uh, of that that I can think of is when we think of some of the in silico methods to uh, evaluate the mutagenic potential of impurities, um, those techniques were developed uh, in concert with uh, and with company access to um, government databases uh, under, under a CRADA agreement. So I think it's gonna take something like that to really speed this along, and if, and if we're really serious, I think you know we need to get going on that sooner rather than later. And then, of course, we, as I mentioned, we've got to to work with regulatory authorities to foster acceptance of these alternative approaches. And ultimately, you know, I think this is something that that's going to have to rise to the level of the ICH um, uh, to be able to really um, push this through. Uh, as these alternatives are um, developed and revised. So with that, um, I would like to um, thank uh, some of my Sotara colleagues, uh, Dr. Hannah Jones and Dr. Suzanne Minton, and also thank um, AAPS for um, the opportunity to come and speak this morning. And with that, I will open the floor to any questions. Hey, Jim, fantastic. Um, thank you so much. And as Jim mentioned, uh, we'd love for our audience to submit their questions. Um, one person wants to know, do you have knowledge of non-animal models, specifically organ on a chip, working well for biologics like antibodies? Uh, I cannot say that I've seen examples of that happening, uh, and I think there may be some technical issues associated with that because, um, you know, that the, the chips themselves are, are very tiny, and I know that some of the um, um, the, the um, cavities in them and, and the and, and the tubing to be able to collect them together uh, or connect those chips together um, might preclude the use of biologics there. But you know, again, uh, I, I haven't seen any any data generated with um, biologics in those systems. But that doesn't mean it, it hasn't happened or can't occur. Makes sense. Um, somebody says that they love the idea of an ICH topic. Do you see this focused as a safety or an efficacy guideline? Um, you know, I think I would see. I would like, you know, given my background, I would like to see it focused as a safety safety guideline, but there's no reason it couldn't be used uh, in it for efficacy studies as well. But I think to have the largest impact and, and cost reductions uh, and potential time savings would be to focus on safety initially. 
makes sense. Because we, you know, we use a lot of animals in toxicology, and some of the studies that we run uh, take a very long time to conduct and report. And you know, if we can eliminate some of those things and really reduce costs and, and speed development, you know, we could potentially, you know, shave a couple of years off the um, non-clinical development program. That's a great point. Someone wants to know whether you think that we should be revisiting microsampling to reduce animal use. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've, I've seen a recent example uh, in, in one of the projects we've been supporting where, you know, we had 10 animals per sex per group uh, in the toxicology portion. And had we not been able to use either microsampling or very sensitive techniques that required minimal amounts of, of blood, you know, we would have had to have uh, another 30 animals per sex per group just to assess exposure. So because of the fact that we had, um, that there were very sensitive techniques available, we could actually collect um, toxicokinetic samples from the main study animals and not have to add um, those additional satellite animals. So I think that there's, you know, and, and whether it's, um, you know, the, the techniques that were tried a few years ago, um, the spotting techniques, um, and I know there were some issues with that, but, um, you know, I think it's definitely worth revisiting because um, the use of satellite animals to assess exposure um, requires a lot of animals. And if we get better on how we can sample and analyze, um, we can, we can um, gain pretty substantial cost savings there. Great. Someone wants to know whether you believe that agency regulatory agencies will become more receptive for animal free or animal less INDs. I think that that is I, I would say that t to me, that's a that's a mid to longer range goal. I think it's going I think there's going to have to be a lot of work done in the interim to demonstrate to them that some of these alternative methods uh, are just as uh, valuable and predictive as some of the animal models. So I think, um, you know, again, I think in the short term, it's going to take sponsors generating uh, data uh, that the FDA expect, that regulators expect through the standard ICH um, studies that are required, as well as at the same time generating data in some of these alternative models um, to be able to demonstrate to the agency and, and build their confidence uh, that these techniques can be applied in some instances. Yep, data, data, and more data. Yep. <laughs> Why is the FDA Modernization Act only eliminating and or reducing the use of animals to assess non-clinical efficacy? Are these alter aren't these alternative methods suitable for assessing clinical efficacy and or safety? Given that the act doesn't abolish, abolish the use of animal testing, is there a benefit to extending the, this, this to the assessment of clinical efficacy and safety? Um, you know, and, and again, I just focused on the non-clinical aspects and, and I'm not completely familiar with, with um, what the act may may uh, include regarding clinical trials, but I will say that there are, I think, in some instances, some of the in silico techniques are much more advanced. And the clinical trial simulations uh, have actually uh, been accepted in lieu of conducting actual trials. So um, I think there's something that that uh, we in the non-clinical space can learn from some of those techniques and how they were developed and validated to the point uh, where they have been accepted uh, and to either uh, particularly with respect to uh, not having to do trials in certain populations um, uh, such as renally impaired or hepatically impaired um, so I, I i think in in some aspects um, with respect to clinical development i think they're a little bit ahead of us yeah, that makes sense. So that looks like that was the last question. Um, these were really fantastic questions from our audience. So thank you so much to them for th their attention and their 
they're great questions and, and thank you to Dr. Jim Herman for that excellent presentation. And finally, we'd like to thank AAPS for hosting this event. This concludes the webinar. Goodbye and have a great day.